In the summer of 2005, Alex and Molly got married on the manicured lawn of the Midyet home in Sugarloaf. By then, Molly says she'd already discovered that love wasn't always so patient and kind. When they moved in together, Alex's demeanor changed. When he got angry, he'd scream and call her names, kick doors and throw things. One time, he threatened her out, she remembers. The next day, she found out she was pregnant. And when she told Alex, he kicked a trash can in her direction and said he wished it had in the stomach. I'm going to come on to the main part of the story, but that in itself is criminal. To make matters worse, Molly's pregnancy was a nightmare. She was diagnosed with pre-eclampsia, a dangerous complication having high blood pressure and gained a lot of weight. On December the 17th, 2005, Jason J. Midiette was born at Boulder Community Hospital. Jason is the subject of this story. Alexandra Midiette was the father and Molly Midiette was the mother. Jason was delivered by cesarean section and at the time of delivery, the gestational age was 36 weeks and one day. Jason was released on December the 24th, 2005, and he had no health issues. At the date of Jason's release, he was a very healthy infant. Upon Jason's release from Boulder County Hospital, Alex, Molly and Jason resided at 102 Barbara Street in the city of Louisville, Boulder County, Colorado. The parents stayed at home to care for Jason until February 2006. This is when the parents returned to work. Molly worked three days a week and Alex would work two days a week. During his life, the parents exclusively cared for Jason. Now, the parents attended four well baby exams conducted by Dr. Jill Siegfried. Siegfried was a general practitioner of Jason throughout his life. Both parents accompanied Jason to each doctor's visit. At the first exam, Three days after Jason's discharge, he had gained nearly a pound. At his second well baby exam, three weeks later, the only concern noted by Dr. Siegfried was a failure to gain weight. Although the parents were asked if they had any concerns at every visit, they never expressed any, with the exception of Jason being gassy. A baby not gaining that much weight and a baby being gassy, these are all normal concerns when a child is born. All of the appointments were routine well baby exams and not the result of any medical concerns expressed by the parents. On February the 15th, 2006, Dr. Siegfried examined Jason and noted that he was a normal, healthy two month old infant. Because of this, Jason was given his two month vaccinations. On the night of February the 23rd, 2006, the parents agreed that Alex would get up for Jason's feedings because Molly had to work the following day. Jason woke up at 2 a.m. and again at 5 a.m. on February the 24th and fed normally. After the 5 a.m. feeding, Alex and Jason fell asleep on the couch together. Alex and Jason next awoke at 7 a.m. and Alex changed Jason's diaper. During the diaper change, however, Jason had a crying spell, appeared to hold his breath and made funny noises and then he just stiffened up. Alex called Molly into the room to observe Jason. Molly left for work at Midyet Architecture Mall Properties in Boulder, Colorado. Alex put Jason down for a nap and Jason woke up around 11 a.m. Alex tried to feed Jason but he wouldn't eat. Alex gave Jason a bath. During the bath, Jason tensed and released his body. Both arms went up into the air and were straight and stiff and his back was very arched. Alex described Jason as almost standing up, which for an infant is impossible. After the bath, Alex laid Jason down and could hear him moaning on the baby monitor. Alex called Molly at work at approximately 11.37 a.m. Molly arrived to work around 9 a.m. that day. In the morning, while in a conversation with two co-workers, Molly expressed her concern that Jason was not doing well and described various symptoms. Molly described Jason clenching his fists when he awoke, tightening his body, shaking his fists, having breathing problems and crunching up his face while his eyes were squeezed together. And this is all peculiar because every time they saw the doctor, they said, no, nothing wrong with him. 
She also used the word seizure to describe Jason's behavior on February the 24th, 2006. Molly also said that as soon as she got off work, she was planning to take Jason to the doctor. Molly also told her workers that she couldn't figure out what the problem was, but she wished she could fix it as soon as possible. The co-workers described Molly as being really upset, concerned and worried when she was describing Jason's condition. After Molly returned home, she called Dr. Siegfried's office at 12.30 p.m. She left a message with the receptionist that Jason was out of it, lethargic, stiffening his arms and legs, moaning, and just not feeling well. After checking with Dr. Siegfried, a member of the office staff called back at 12.52 p.m. and instructed Molly that if Molly thought Jason needed immediate medical attention, she should consider taking Jason to urgent care or the emergency room. Molly said, no, I want to see Dr. Siegfried. Between the time Molly returned home and the 3.30 p.m. doctor's appointment, both Molly and Alex remained at home and could hear Jason continuing to moan. Molly and Alex arrived at the doctor's office at 3.30 p.m. One of the nurses described Jason as limp, with his eyes half open and not moving. She said that when Jason was moved, it looked like he was going to cry, then he would moan and fall asleep. The nurse said she had never seen a baby like that before and immediately called Dr. Siegfried. Now, the doctor saw Jason and indicated that Jason had a bulging fontanelle, that Jason was grey, limp and lethargic. Jason's condition scared the doctor and she immediately called another physician within the office to come and look at him. Dr. Siegfried's medical records state that the chief complaints and concerns regarding the baby were that he wasn't waking up or eating, the baby was being limp and lethargic, and he could not track movement. So the question remains, when he was born he was fine, each doctor's visit he was fine, now you get these symptoms where he's in pain, so there's an event that happened that nobody is talking about. I'll come on to that. The records also state that this happened after he had a diaper change and he held his breath until he passed out. He was fine yesterday, but he was not eating normally today, he was only groaning. Dr. Siegfried next advised the parents to take Jason to the Boulder Community Hospital as he was much too ill to be treated in her office. Alex and Molly drove to the hospital, arriving at 4pm. When they get there, they see Dr. David Jones, who was the emergency room doctor, and he immediately contacted Dr. Stephen Fries, a pediatrician, to assist with Jason. The physicians noted that Jason was posturing and unresponsive, with his right pupil fixed and dilated, indicating brain injury. A CT scan was ordered, and the results showed a skull fracture, mixed chronic and acute subdural hematomas, and a complete loss of grey-white interface involving the cerebrum. Now, although for me that was a bit of a word salad, brain injury, fractures, this isn't random. Somebody hurt this child. X-rays taken indicated a number of fractures in various stages of healing. These fractures included the left parietal skull fracture, a right clavicle fracture, a left forearm fracture, corner fractures of both femurs, and fractures on both ends of the left tibia. What on earth happened to this child? The hospital nurse, Susan Spielman, asked the parents if Jason had been dropped, fallen, fallen off a changing table, or if he had hit his head on something. The parents replied, no, nothing has happened, nobody has done this to him. Nurse Spielman, radiologist technician Tina Gerhardt, and Dr. Fries heard Molly make the comment, I knew I shouldn't have gone to work today. BCH radiologist technician Christy Rouse heard one of the parents state that the child had been vomiting for the past two nights and that he was not acting like himself that day. Dr. Fries informed Molly and Alex of Jason's condition, including the fractures, Alex became angry and repeatedly stated that there were no bruises. Jason was then transported by Flight for Life ground ambulance to Children's Hospital. X-rays revealed additional fractures that were in various stages of healing. These additional fractures included numerous rib fractures, fractures to the hands and feet, and additional arm and leg corner fractures. CT scans performed at Children's Hospital showed that Jason's brain injuries were getting worse and portions of the brain were dead. Before I continue on with the story, I want to ask you, 
What do you think happened? Comment, let me know. During the course of Jason's treatment, Molly and Alex made statements at Children's Hospital denying that Jason had been dropped or had fallen. The parents indicated that Jason had been fined the evening of February the 23rd, 2006. At the hospital on February the 24th, Molly told Dr. Antonoa Chiesa that Jason's left arm did not move very well. The following day, both parents told Stephanie Strunks, a hospital social worker, that Jason had always had a limp left arm. It just hung there, they said. Molly and Alex told Dr. Megan Norton at the hospital, who was a DSS social worker, that Jason had vomited three times since Tuesday, February the 21st. Molly and Alex also told her that on February the 21st, Jason had screamed so long, he lost his breath, appeared to stiffen and had been doing some twitching, tensing and releasing of his body since that date. On February the 21st, 2006, Molly had a postpartum medical appointment with Dr. Siegfried that she attended alone while Alex took care of Jason. At that visit, Molly told the doctor that Jason was doing very well. Now, between February and March 2006, the social services department spoke to the family of Alex and Molly, and they confirmed that Alex and Molly did complain at times that Jason's crying was excessive. They also mentioned he did have some breathing difficulties. Alex and Molly both told the social workers that Jason was crying more than normal and he needed comforting more than they expected. In fact, Alex and Molly expressed concerns about Jason's rigidity and that his crying was becoming more difficult to soothe. So towards the back end of February is when they took Jason into hospital. But unfortunately, on March the 1st, 2006, his life support machine was withdrawn. And on March the 3rd, Jason died. Dr. John Mayer, a forensic pathologist associated with the Boulder County Coroner's Office, performed an autopsy on Jason's body on March the 4th. The Boulder County Coroner's Office ruled Jason Midiette's death as a homicide. Dr. Mayer determined that the cause of death of this 10-week-old infant was blunt force craniocerebral injuries. Again, another word salad. Dr. Mayer sent the brain for neuropathologic examination for Dr. Ross Reichard. In his report, Dr. Reichard notes that neuropathological examination revealed evidence of traumatic injuries of varying ages. Ages, that's key. This wasn't one incident, he's trying to say. Dr. Reichard determined that Jason had contusions on the right and left temporal lobes of his brain. These contusions were older than other hemorrhages found in Jason's brain. Dr. Meyer was able to confirm a number of the fractures previously identified by both Boulder Hospital and the Children's Hospital. During the course of the autopsy, Dr. Meyer identified three previously undetected fractures located in the right hand, foot and rib. Dr. Thomas Hay, pediatric radiologist at the University of Colorado, reviewed the CT scans and skeletal surveys from the Boulder Hospital and noted that Jason's fractures were in various stages of healing, with the oldest fracture being on the right clavicle and on his right forearm. Dr. Hay identified the skull fracture as acute, showing no signs of healing, and said that such fractures in infants were caused by an impact. Did he fall? He said rib fractures have to have a known mechanism of injury and are commonly caused by abusive squeezing. Dr. Hay said that bucket handle fractures were observed on the long bones of the arms and legs. They are caused by twisting or pulling forces applied near the end of a bone or from violent shaking. Dr. Hayes said hand and foot fractures are very uncommon and are likely the result of a direct blow. So according to the coroner's office, he was murdered and he was either dropped or squeezed. Sarah Vernet is friends with Alex and Molly and had known them for about 13 years. In early to mid-January 2006, Sarah said she saw a dime-sized bruise in the area of Jason's forehead. Sarah observed the bruise on Jason's head and asked Alex about the bruise. Alex responded that he felt bad because he had been walking, he slipped and bumped Jason's head into a wooden dining room chair. Alex said that the incident had occurred that day, a couple of hours before Sarah's arrival. Molly was not home on the day of this incident and Sarah later told Molly about this bruise. 
On February the 24th, around 1 p.m., Sarah talked to Molly on the phone. During the conversation, Molly told Sarah that Jason was really sick and something was wrong with him. Molly described him as lethargic and making weird sounds. Molly explained, something is wrong with him. I've never seen him like this and something is different with him. Sarah said that Molly sounded concerned and very scared in the conversation. Another one of their friends visited Molly and Alex at their home during the first week of January 2006. This was the only time that she saw Jason. The friend recounted a five second incident where Jason, while awake, turned red in color like he was going to the bathroom. He was also clenching his fists. Molly told the friend that she did not know why Jason was doing this, but that he did it sometimes. On Tuesday, January the 3rd, 2006, Jason had a doctor's appointment at 4.30 p.m. for his circumcision. No concerns were voiced by Molly to the doctor. Now, our friend, Josh Logan, who had been a friend of Alex's for the past few years, believed that Alex and Molly returned to work after Jason's birth in the second week of February. Alex worked Tuesday and Wednesday and Molly worked Monday, Thursday and Friday. The non-working parent cared for Jason. Josh was not aware of any other care provider. In early to mid-January, Josh observed a bruise in the area of Jason's temple. He said the bruise was between the eye and the air. The bruise was typical bruise color, possibly bluish black and the size of a nickel. Josh stated that right when he entered the home, Alex told him about the bruise before Josh even saw Jason. Josh described Alex as very nervous when he told Josh that he had been carrying Jason into the kitchen when the phone rang. Alex indicated that when he turned around to get the phone, he bumped Jason's head on a kitchen chair, causing the bruise. Alex said the incident had taken place a couple of days earlier. The bruise lasted about a week. So you got the incident earlier where Alex bumped Jason's head on the chair when he's with Sarah. Now you got the incident with Josh. It seems that Alex was very careless with the child and that Molly was unable to think, well, maybe there's something really wrong with him. I need to take him to the doctor. Josh remembered several conversations prior to February in which Alex and Molly discussed Jason flexing his muscles and describing his arms and legs being tense. Josh talked to Alex on the phone several times in February. Josh believed that in an initial call, he could hear Jason crying in the background. In an interview with Detective Steele, on July the 27th, 2006, Josh stated that Alex told him they were taking Jason to the doctor because he was a bit lethargic and wasn't eating. In late January or early February, Molly showed her mother, Jane Bowers, a very light colored bruise that was located on Jason's forehead by an eyebrow. Molly told Jane that the bruise occurred while Alex was holding Jason as he bent down to pick something off the floor in the dining room and bumped Jason's head on a chair when he stood up and this goes back to the carelessness have you guys ever held a, an infant they are so delicate the slightest touch you can't help and be like oh oh no are you okay rub the baby make sure it's okay so for the baby to have a bruise an infant to have a bruise that's serious you can't just you know chalk it off as just a random occurrence like these two did. Molly further told Jane that she was not home during this incident and that she learned that Jason did not cry but his eyes just popped open. Additionally, Molly told Jane there was something wrong with Jason's arm and Molly described it as sort of floating. Further, Molly told Jane that she and Alex talked to the doctor about it and showed her the arm. Molly said that the doctor just called it a simpy arm and it's okay. Dr. Seafried said that Molly or Alex never informed her about a problem with Jason's arm. Jason's medical records do not reflect any mention of this concern. Now Kay Midyet was Alex's mother and she stated that on the morning between February 2nd and February the 7th, Alex called her and said while he was reaching for the cell phone, he bumped Jason's head on the edge of a table. Kay personally saw a bruise and described it as being located in the middle of Jason's forehead. It was the size of her little finger, smaller than a dime. The bruise was light yellowish in color and she thought that it lasted a couple of days. Kay said she received a call from Alex sometime prior to February the 2nd where Alex expressed concern about bleeding from an injury to Jason's gum. And through all of this, you still didn't think I should tell a doctor? Remember, they kept going to Dr. Siegfried saying, no, everything's okay. 
Molly later expressed a concern to Kay about a second bleed from the gum when giving him a pacifier. The area of the blood was described as the front center area of the upper gum. But what's interesting is during the trial, Dr. Secret said there was never any gum issues mentioned. Nobody told me this and she had never used a metal probe to examine Jason's gums. After the death of Jason, Alex was dealing with Jason's loss very differently than Molly was. He refused to see a grief counsellor and would go out with friends, drinking and smoking pot, even doing cocaine. Molly says she'd known he was into that when they met, but she thought he'd quit when she got pregnant. Still, Molly said she never seriously questioned Alex, never wondered whether something had happened when Jason was in his care. Eventually, after all the medical reports were said and done, Molly and Alex were indicted on seven counts of child abuse. And on February the 29th, 2008, Molly was found guilty and sentenced to 16 years in prison. Alex also received the same sentence. Jason was 10 weeks old and he never tasted solid food. He was born at the Boulder Hospital. 10 weeks later, his life ended at that same hospital. It seems what happened was innocuous. I don't for once think Alex did this on purpose. We can put it down to being careless, to being immature, to being stupid. But it's the failure to act. It's the lack of concern that the parents showed. So the question remains, were the sentences correct? Is 16 years enough? Comment, let me know what you think.